after. Okay, this is Physics 1A for, uh, we're at May 11th, uh, and today we're talking about um, angular momentum. I've got a bunch of problems uh, regarding angular momentum, so let's, let's get right to uh, what angular momentum is. First, I'm going to give you a reason why you should care about angular momentum, okay? So I want you to imagine that you have a bicycle wheel. Okay, and this bicycle wheel is rotating on a fixed axis. And then the wheel itself is just rotating in a circle. Okay, with some angular speed that we can call omega. But it's just it's just spinning. Okay. And let's say that it's spinning at a constant speed, so there's no losses due to um, friction or anything like that at the axis. So it's just spinning. Now, if I was to ask you what the momentum of this object is, like the linear momentum, the answer would be zero, and I can easily prove it to you. Suppose that I take one point on this object, and I say that that point has a velocity in this direction, and we call it v. And then I come to a point 180 degrees away on the other side, and I say this point has a velocity v as well. And then we say, okay, that little piece right there, let's say, has a mass that we call m, and this little piece that we're considering here of our wheel has a mass that we call m. Okay. That's its velocity. This is this one's velocity. So the momentum up here would be mv, right? And down here, I'd say the momentum would be um, something like negative mv, right? P is for momentum. Momentum is mass times velocity, but it's a vector. So I'd say that if this is velocity v, that this is velocity negative v, and that the momentum would be negative mv, right? Does that make sense to everybody? So, um, if you were to take the total momentum of these objects, you could say that the total linear momentum would be zero, right? You guys agree with that? For every object, for every point that I pick up here, there's another point over here. If I pick a point over here, it's going to be going down. But if I pick a point over here, it's going to be going up. And so those two would cancel. Does that all make sense to you guys? The total linear momentum of this object, if it's rotating on a fixed axis, is zero. This would be like, take your bicycle, turn it upside down so that it's sitting on the, so the seats, seat and the handlebars are on the ground, right? And you just spin the wheel. That bike's not going anywhere, so it has no linear momentum, right? The center of mass actually has to move to get any linear momentum, right? Nonetheless... If you were to stick your hand inside of here, you would still feel a force, right? When that when that wheel kicked over, yeah? You'd still feel a force. So in a very real sense, this object does have some kind of momentum, right? Because momentum is this idea that like, you've got an object that's moving along, it's got mass, it's got velocity, it's gonna keep moving, right? And the amount of force that it hits something with is gonna be related to the amount of momentum that it has. Um, but this object, even though it has no linear momentum, it has some kind of momentum, right? And the type of momentum we, we say that it has is, is what's called angular momentum. And I'll just tell you right now, like, what it is for this object is actually pretty simple. I mean, it can go for, through a derivation and stuff, but there's really no point. We use the symbol, um, I don't know why it's awful. We use capital L. I have no idea why we do this stuff for angular momentum. Um, this is, well... Yeah, this is the symbol, okay? And for this object here, I would say the angular momentum is actually equal to the moment of inertia of the object multiplied by the angular speed. It's a vector, okay? But that's how it's defined, okay? It's the angular momentum of the object is the moment of inertia multiplied by the angular speed. The angular speed in this sense, it has to be measured in radians to get this in the right unit. The unit for this... Um, there's different types of units, like newton seconds and stuff like this, but it's just kilogram meter per second. No, kilogram meter squared per second, excuse me. Like mass times volume. Wait, what's mass times volume? You mean density times volume? Oh, yeah, 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 mass times velocity, yeah. Right, exactly, so this is like the mass, right? like similar to mass that was kind of bad this is like kind of similar to mass and this is like you know speed velocity whatever you want to call it okay 
So that's angular momentum. Now there's other ways it can be defined though. The more proper way in which it's defined is like this. We take some point, we call that point P, okay? Let's say that I have an object here and let's say that it has a velocity V and let's say that it has a mass of little m. Calling that point P maybe is not a good thing because that looks like momentum or something like that. This is just, it's some point, let's call it A maybe. Now, to define angular momentum, you, you have to pick a point to define it about, all right? And this is how it's defined. I take a line and I draw it from A out to where the object is. So we draw a line and then we create a vector. That vector is called R, the position vector R. So I've got a velocity vector V, a position vector R, and a mass. And then we say you can define angular momentum as being basically R crossed with the momentum of the object, where the momentum of the object in this case happens to be mass times velocity. It's R cross P, okay? The magnitude of, this is a cross product, right? So hopefully you remember how to do that. The magnitude of the momentum then is gonna be something like R times momentum is MV, and then you need to multiply by the sine of the angle, we'll use this angle right here, the sine of the angle between the two of them, okay? This is our definition of what the angular momentum would be. This would be for a point mass and this is for a rigid object. I can prove where this one comes from. I just, I, it comes from basically saying break the whole object up into a bunch of points, you know, write this down and then eventually you can prove that you get this. You're more than welcome to go read about that derivation. You can even try the derivation yourself. I don't think it's particularly useful. I think it's just a good idea to know that uh, that these are the two different definitions of what angular momentum are. If you have a rigid object, this is angular momentum. You take mode inertia times angular speed. If you have a point mass, then you take m times velocity times r, and you multiply by sine phi, and that gives you the angular momentum. And we'll do we'll do some object we'll do some problems here with this to understand what's going on. So something to understand that's really important here is that you can have angular momentum even if you don't have a rotating object. Does that make sense? Like angular momentum, here, how to, how to say this? You can't really define an angular speed for this guy. Would you guys agree with that statement? I have a massive object with a velocity v in this direction. It's just it's just it's just traveling, it's cruising along on a straight line, right? It looks it looks to have only linear momentum, but you can still have angular momentum about some point. You just pick a point, and you can define what the angular momentum is. Does that make sense to you guys? Now, you're, I gave you a packet long ago. Hopefully, you guys still have it. I don't know if you still do or not. I think I posted it on the internet too. And there's a summary of things about angular momentum. And it uses some symbols that I don't personally use. But um, it's something that's worth reading. It's something that's worth knowing when you do the problems. Um, I think I have it still pulled up here, so I want to draw your attention to one thing real quick. We'll be doing these examples, and here's the definition of what angular momentum is all that stuff. But this is the part that's really, really, really important right here. Okay? Just to show you where this is, if you go to this packet, or you go to the website, or uh, to Canvas, you look at angular momentum summary, and they, you know, it talks all about this stuff, and you know, here's this picture that I kind of saw, showed you as well. Um, it's really, it's really these, these like section five and section six are going to be the most useful to you, and really it's this section here that's the most useful to you, okay? And I'll, I'll be referring back to this as we do problems, so I can show you the difference between the type of problems we're going to be doing here. Angular momentum is a little tricky, though, and it has some caveats about how you solve problems with it. This is where you really, really have to understand physics really well to solve these kind of problems because they take into account pretty much everything we've learned so far. Um, yeah. So, angular momentum, we use, yep. That's right, yeah, exactly. Use L equal to I omega when there is a rotating object versus L equal to uh, R cross B when there isn't. That's exactly right, yep. Um, and you're gonna see in the problems that we do that you kind of have to use both of them sometimes. Okay, you'll see you'll see how that works in these problems that we do. But that's generally that's all there is to angular momentum. It's just this new idea 
You take position cross with momentum, and you get the angle. Okay. All right. So, why do we care about angular momentum? All right. So I'm going to show you guys uh, a little derivation that I, that I find to be kind of cool. So we start off with this. We start off with Newton's second law. Newton's second law states that if I take um, the time derivative of momentum, that I get the net force acting on an object. This is the same thing as mass times acceleration, right? It's exactly the same thing. All right. So what I want to do now is I basically want to let me let me erase this real quick here. Um, I want to do. Here, I need to make some room. Because the order actually matters. What I want to do now is I want to do this. I want to do r cross f on the left hand side, and I want to do r cross this thing on the right hand side. Okay. R is a position vector, P is a momentum vector, right? Now on the left hand side right here, if I take R and I cross it with the sum of all forces, what am I gonna get out of this? It's gonna be what you get torque, right? So this is gonna become on the left hand side. Oops. This is gonna become net torque. Now on the right hand side, what I want to do is I wanna pull the R cross into the derivative here kind of show you something that happens. Uh, yeah. You can see that this is angular momentum, right? R cross P. So this tells us something about how torque and angular momentum are related to each other. Am I doing this correctly? Oh, no, 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 I can't do this yet. This statement won't make any sense. No, 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 this is what I want to do. We leave this term the same, and now I'm going to add something to this. It will not. I'm going to add zero. I can do this, right? Would you guys agree with this statement? I can add zero to this equation, and it won't change the equation. <laughs> I know that's a stupid question, but you guys agree I can do that. So the first thing we did was we multiplied both sides by r, we cross products, and now I'm going to add zero. Is that okay with you guys? Okay, just making sure just so you guys can see the steps that I'm doing right here. What's something that's equal to zero? Well, I'll show you something that's equal to zero. If I was to take um, this cross products with this. Yep. If I take MV, which is, this is really momentum, okay? And I cross products it with dr dt, why would this be equal to zero? Well, if they're orth orthogonal, means at right angles, right? Like, if I have A cross B and they're orthogonal, then it would just be A times B, right? But if they're parallel, something like A cross A, for example, what's A cross A equal to? That's zero, right? So why is this zero? dr dt, what is this equal to? Yeah, that's velocity. So we basically have a situation where we're doing... Uh, I won't put it in here, but... Uh, yeah, I'll put it like this. This becomes like P crossed with velocity, but these are parallel to each other, so this entire expression is zero, right? All right. That's why I'm adding zero. Oops. That's why that's the same thing as adding zero. But then, and this is the step that I skipped, um, since this thing is P, you should be able to recognize this whole thing as a chain rule, right? This is the same thing as this. You guys see it? It's exactly the same thing. And this, right here, is equal to the time derivative of L. So this gives us our Newton's second law equation, where there's two different ways to say what net torque does. It either has the effect of increasing angular acceleration, or you can think about it as the time derivative of angular momentum. That's the rotational equivalent of Newton's second law right there. And you can see how it's related to the other version of Newton's second law, which says that net force equals ma, which equals dp dt. Right? 
you can see how that how these two basically directly relate to each other. So there we go. All right, that is all the theory. Get all the theory out of the way fast, and it allows us to meet. That took 15 minutes, which is pretty good. Now, I hope you guys understand this, but we're not going to understand it really until we try to do some of these problems. So that's what we're going to do. Any general questions about, about what angular momentum is? It's the momentum associated with rotation, effectively. When an object's rotating, it has a type of momentum. We call it angular momentum. It's the momentum of rotating. Except that there's also another way to talk about it where you have an object that's moving in a straight line. So, Where did the R-cross sum of forces come from? Uh, right here. Okay, let me, let me do the derivation really quickly, just in general, and we'll erase it. So we start with uh, this equation here. We have, we know this to be true. That's Newton's second law. And all we did was, we just said R cross this and R cross this. That's what I did. We just multiply both sides by the same thing, effectively. Because then we kind of know this is net torque. And we know that this becomes, as I said, DLDT. So that's the idea. Good question. Yeah, once the derivation's already there, I think it's hard to see where they came from for sure. Please tell me I'm recording, right? I think I am. Yep. I don't know if it's this class or 1C that I went through like an entire set of, like an entire hour of lecture without recording. All right, so here's the problem we want to do. Um, so go ahead and read it. I'll give you guys a second to read it and think about it. Okay, so it says, a small disk of mass m is connected to a fixed point c by a perfect chord of length l. The small mass slides along a frictionless horizontal plane with a speed of v naught. Determine the closest approach, oh sorry, the distance of closest approach to the fixed point is v. Determine the angular velocity omega after the chord pulls the mass into a circular path of radius l. All right, this is a very, uh, just like, kind of like bare bones uh, angular momentum problem. Let's try to draw a picture of what's going on. So here's our mass m. It's got a velocity v in this direction, or v naught. It's attached to a very small string. Maybe we can just like really, let's do this. It's got this really like loose string right here. And that string is attached um, to a point, let's put it right here, that we call C. And we also know that the distance between here and here is V. And we also know that at some point in later in time, that chord is going to be taut, maybe to here or something like this, at which point the chord is hot or tight or whatever you want to say it's it's not stretched it's not loose um how does that word to old timey for you guys we'll just say that the the cord is tight at that point and we know that the length of this cord is l and that once the cord goes stops being slack the ball can no longer move along um the straight line here it was moving along a straight line path like this but once it gets to here, it is now going to basically start to rotate um, in a circular path. Sorry. Maybe? Let's see if this is worth doing. Go like that. Got to there. Not perfect. 
it's eventually going to go along a path to something like this, then. Oops. Something like that, right? So once it gets to this point, it's now going to be traveling in a circular path with an angular speed that we're calling omega, okay? And its velocity vector is now going to be pointing, at least at this point, its velocity vector is going to be pointing like this. We call it V. Kind of looks like an R. Okay. So this is like initial. Oops. And then this path out here is the, the kind of final situation. Now we're gonna need to do a little derivation before we can solve this problem. Um, let's go ahead and just say it really quickly here. I said a second ago that we said that net torque acting on a system should be equal to the time rate of change of the angular momentum of the system, okay? Now the reality is that this is going to have to represent a net external torque to the system. And what I would argue is this would require that you have some type of pushing force acting on your system, okay? Take the bicycle wheel from before, a net external torque would be something like, okay, let's scroll up just a little bit here. If someone were to apply a force here to make the bicycle wheel turn by pushing downward this way, the wheel would spin, right? That would be an external torque, okay? In this system, I'm gonna argue that there is no external torque, okay? Which means that the time derivative of the momentum is zero and if the time derivative of the momentum is zero, that means that the momentum itself, really the total momentum of your system, has to be constant. This is an expression of uh, conservation of angular momentum. It states basically that if I know the initial angular momentum of my system, it should be equal to the final angular momentum of my system as long as there are no external torques. So the net torque external to your system has to be zero for this to be true. And if it's not, then you use that equation at the top. So in our system here, we're gonna use exactly this equation. We're gonna say that from the initial to the final, we're gonna use conservation of angular momentum to solve what's going on here, okay? Now, to find the initial angular momentum of my system, our definition was, oops, we basically need to draw a line from here to here. We call that R, we call this angle phi, and then we say that our initial angular momentum should be something like the mass of the object multiplied by its velocity and then multiplied by the distance r from c to this point here um, and then times the sine of the angle phi. Now looking at this picture right here, if b is a perpendicular distance away from the, the line that the, the ball is moving on, what is r sine phi equal to? Yep. r sine phi equals b. Yep. That means our initial angular momentum in this case is actually just m times initial velocity times b. If you think about what that means, Consider the following scenario. Suppose that I have an object that's moving through space, okay? It's moving through space, right? And I pick some arbitrary point down here that I call C. And I want to describe what the momentum of this object is. If I draw a line like this, then this distance right here, let's say we call it, I don't know, what, B or something like this. Can you see that the angular momentum for this object is always just going to be MVB? About that point C? It's always going to be the same. It's exactly like the lever arm. That's where I was going to go next. It's like the lever arm in torque. Yeah. 
it's exactly like the lever arm, right? It's you take the velocity vector, you draw it forever, and then you just find that perpendicular distance right there, and that gives you that gives you the angular momentum. When you solve problems in like um, astrophysics about objects in distant space traveling near a planet or something like this, like suppose like let's let's let's, let's turn this into a real problem. What if this is the Earth? Okay, and this is an asteroid. This would represent uh, tell you something about the angular momentum of the object, but what's going to happen is as this asteroid comes closer and closer to Earth, it's it's going to have its path deflected like this due to gravity. Um, but we actually this um, this thing has a name in science. I believe it's called the impact parameter, and we use it in particle physics scattering. They also use it in cosmology and astrophysics to describe objects from far distances, and it kind of comes back to this. Uh, the idea that once you have a fixed point, like Earth, where you're observing an asteroid from, if you want to know what the angular momentum of this object is about Earth, it's going to be determined by the distance of closest approach, basically. Does that make sense? So, it's just an example of the type of problems you probably see when you're solving things, once we get to the gravity section, at least. I think it's called the impact parameter. At least that's what we call it in my field. The... So that's your initial angular momentum, right? And what about our final angular momentum? Well, my picture here, what I've said is that we've got this distance L, a velocity V, which is, this is basically your tangential velocity. And now there's a right angle right here. We could use I omega, um, but I'll show you get the same thing in two different ways. So I would say another way to describe this for final angular momentum would be M times V times L. And then we'd also multiply by the sine of the angle between the two of them, which is 90 degrees. But we also know there's a relationship between V and omega, right? Which is that uh, V is equal to, in this case, L times omega, right? And those vector signs don't make any sense. So if we put that into here, we're going to get M times L times omega times L, which is equal to ML squared times omega, and then this is the thing that's the same thing as I omega right here. Because I, in this case, is the moment of inertia of a point mass, and the moment of inertia of point mass is just its mass times the radius squared, in this case, which is length. So yeah, you can use either way. You've got to use I omega, or you can just work it out this way, you get the same answer. Does that make sense to everybody? Anyone have any questions? That's what we were looking for, right? Is omega. Oh, how did I know it was L final? Okay. So, just going back to our definition, right? I'm basically using this version because it's a point mass. We take uh, radius, which is the distance from the... This is the... R is the distance from the center, A. Oh, no. This is the distance from the center out to where the object is, right? You multiply by the momentum, which is mv, and then times the sine of the angle between them. So in this problem, once my mass gets to here, so here's mass, right? And now it's moving around in a circle. Since it's going in a circle, its velocity should be changing, but the speed is constant, and the angular speed should be constant. So I just use the same definition as I did here. You say L final should be equal to mass times my new velocity v times the distance from c to here, which is, you know, that distance is l, right? And then you multiply by the sine of the angle between that vector there, the l vector, which goes that way, and the v vector, which goes this way, so there's a right angle here, which means the angle is 90 degrees, so you're just left with mvl. mvl. Hopefully that makes sense. Anyway, so that's a pretty basic uh, angular momentum problem. It's not super tricky, but it's it's a good way to be introduced to, to what these things are. We'll, we'll move on to more difficult things here now, too.
let's just let's keep going. This is gonna be kind of like just things getting just a little trickier each time. Actually, this problem's even easier, but. Okay, this is the one where we're really going to use this expression, that the angular momentum is equal to i times omega. Remember, omega has a direction, right? If I have an object, like let's say I've got like a ring or something, if it spins like that, then the angular velocity vector points up by the right-hand rule. You just wrap your fingers in the direction of rotation, your thumb points in the direction of the vector. So when an object's rotating, that's also the direction that the angular momentum vector points, right? Oh, I thought I picked a different color. There we go. The angular momentum vector also points in the same direction. Just like angular, just like linear momentum points in the same direction as velocity. Okay, this is the, this is one of the problems where it just makes me really sad we're not in the classroom, because... Probably some of you guys have tried this before. If you took Physics 2A here, I suspect you saw this. But So you have a man standing at the center of a frictionless turntable, okay? And I will do my best to draw kind of a rough uh, picture of like what this looks like. So I've got, a, I've got a turntable here. Okay, and so I've got like a wheel or something that can rotate. Right? And on top of this wheel that can rotate, um, so it rotates like this. I've got a person standing here. Um, it tells us the mode of inertia of the man plus table is this. It's constant. He's set rotating at one revolution in two seconds while holding a five kilogram block one meter from the axis of rotation in each hand. So a meter away. He's got a five kilogram block. Same thing over here. And one meter for an arm span. I guess that's reasonable. So this is one meter. One meter. And then I've got these two masses. One here and one here. Alright. God, the one M and the mass. Like, that's weird. Maybe we just call the mass capital M. Capital M. Just so that uh, it distinguishes itself from the little M for meters. Okay. We also know that the moment of inertia of man plus table is 6 kilogram meters squared. So he's set rotating at 1 revolution in 2 seconds. So that means that his, I would call it his frequency, his frequency or rate of rotation, is 1 rev per 2 seconds, which would be equal to 0 0.5 revolutions per second. We can put that in the language of angular speed if we want to by doing 2 pi times frequency and getting that his angular speed is going to be pi radians per second. Okay? So this is the initial picture. He is um, he's rotating, and let's say that he's, he's rotating with an angular speed omega, right? So the system is rotating around like this. <clears throat> Maybe even we call that omega initial. So that's your initial situation. And then what happens is that he drops his hands down to his sides so that they're 20 centimeters from the axis of rotation. So let's draw a picture of that. So now we've got our same um, turntable here. And the only difference now is that he's um, holding his hands a little farther down to his side. So now His hands are kind of held like this. So now he's got his blocks here, and he's got a block here. But now the distance between here and here is going to be 20 centimeters instead of one meter. Okay. And as a result of doing this, his angular speed, well, what should happen to it? What do you guys think is going to happen to his angular speed if you've ever done this before? It increases, yeah. This is what happens when a figure skater is like skating along about to do like a triple axel or something like that. They hold their arms out, they jump into the air, they bring their arms and their body in, they do three spins, and then they, before they hit the ground again, they push their arms back out again. 
You guys have all seen figure skaters do this before, right? You can pull up the video, I guess. I think you guys have all probably seen this before, I hope. Same thing happens with divers. So we'll talk more about that. We'll do the problem real quick, and then we'll talk more about the kind of, like, the way this works with diving and figure skating and, uh, like, skateboarding and uh, snowboarding and all the other things where you want to do a lot of spins, right? Like, in snowboarding, people want to get, like, what's, what's a good number of rotations if you do off a jump, like, a half pipe in snowboarding? Like, 1080 is really easy with snowboarding, right? But they can go even more, something like that. You do, like, five rotations or something, right? I don't know. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um... So this is our this is our situation here. Uh, it starts off with his arms out, he pulls his arms in, and he starts to rotate faster. How many of you guys, like, did any of you see this demonstration at El Camino? You did, in 2A, right now. I suspect almost any physics teacher you had would show you that, assuming they knew that it existed, right? It's a chair, and you basically, you sit in the chair, you push your arms out with uh, weights, Someone makes you spin, and then you pull your arms in, and you feel yourself spin, spin really, really, really fast. And this is all due to conservation of angular momentum. So the first part of the problem says to find the initial and the final rotational inertia. So this is going to be our initial situation here. This is going to be our final situation here. So let's find I initial, and let's find I final. So I would say that uh, the initial uh, moment of inertia is going to be equal to... Let's call this I, just so I don't have to write this every single time. Let's just call that I. I'm going to say that the moment of inertia of the whole system here is going to be equal to that same moment of inertia of the man on the table plus the moment of inertia of the blocks, okay? Now, the moment of inertia of the man on the table is 6. Okay, we'll just leave that as I. Plus, the moment of inertia of the blocks is going to be mass multiplied by 1 meter squared. We treat the blocks as if they're basically point masses, and then there's two of them, so we put a two in front of this, right? Two blocks at a distance of one meter away. Turns out it'd be the same if he held both of the blocks in one hand and just let his arm fall to the ground. So, the initial moment of inertia, then, is going to be equal to I, which we said was six kilogram meters squared, plus two times the mass, which was five kilograms, and then one meter squared. Yeah, that's not very good. One meter squared, and I think we can do this in our heads, I think it's 16, right? Two times five is 10 plus six, yeah, 16. Hopefully you guys have no questions about that. We can go on to the other one. Or, well, maybe you do. Do you guys have any questions? For the final moment of inertia, what we have here is going to be the moment of inertia of the man plus the table. That's still there. Plus, now we're going to take the blocks. We'll call it I prime blocks because it's now different. The moment of inertia of the blocks is going to be the mass of the blocks, big M. Um, there's still two of them. But now we multiply by this distance here, 0 0.2 meters full squared. So it's going to be 6 plus 2 times 5 times 0 0.2. So 10, I think this is equal to, you guys can do the calculation for me and tell me if this is right. I think this is what you're going to get. I don't know why, I, I just remember that this is 16 and this is like some factor of 4, but not 16. Boom. Is that cool with you guys? Yep. Yep. That's exactly right, Ash. The lower the moment of inertia, the easier it is to rotate. Exactly. And that's why he spins faster. You guys have any questions? So let's do B. 
for part B, what we're going to do here is we're going to state that um, the initial moment of inertia, or sorry, the initial angular momentum of the system should be equal to the final angular momentum of the system. Now again, this is a statement of conservation of angular momentum. It is only true if the net external force acting on the system is zero. Do you see any external forces acting on the system? Maybe gravity? Gravity is certainly acting on this. It's acting on this. Um, but it doesn't produce any torque. I think I said force. It doesn't produce any torque if you think about it because the gravity here and the gravity here are the same. So it doesn't produce any torque. Likewise, the normal force acting on this person is down, is up, and it counterbalances with the weight big MG. So you have no external torques here. Can you see how this one and this one would cancel each other out in terms of torque? In addition to the fact that they don't really produce any torque about the rotational axis, for sure. Right? These two things, would you agree that these two weights don't have any effect on the object's ability to rotate around a circle like this? I don't know if that's too hard to see. But does that make sense? To get an external torque, it would almost have to be kind of like in the same direction as the rotation or in the opposite direction of the rotation. Like if someone came along and pushed on this person's hand right here, that would be a net external torque, right? If they pushed on the hand outwards towards out of the screen, or if they pushed into the screen, that would be an external torque. Does that make sense? But this system doesn't have anything like that. So we can say that the net external torque is zero, so the initial angular momentum needs to be equal to the final angular momentum. So there's a lot of things I said there. Yeah, no, we do. If there is an external torque, it just becomes the net external torque is equal to the time rate of change of the momentum. Or it could be something like just the change in the momentum divided by the time. Right? That's how it would change. That's it. You'd have some like L final minus L initial divided by the time interval, and that would be equal to the torque. So if you knew the torque, and you knew how long the torque was acting, you could find the change in momentum of the system. It's like impulse, right? It's similar to impulse. And we'll talk more about that as we go through more of these problems. Okay, does that answer your question, Ash? You get an expression like this, basically. The, the torque is going to have the effect of changing the momentum instead of the momentum being equal to each other, basically, right? And then when this is zero, well, then these are equal to each other. Okay. So we want to say initial angular momentum is equal to final angular momentum. That's an equation that could be turned into this. Well, right, it's going to be basically the initial moment of inertia multiplied by the initial angular speed should be equal to the final moment of inertia multiplied by the final angular speed. That just becomes omega final is equal to um, I initial divided by I final multiplied by omega initial. And we have all the values for this. So omega final is going to be equal to um, I initial, which you can see right here is 16, um, divided by I final, which is 6.4. And then times omega initial, which I think was pi. Right? Right here. Now, at this point, I don't know if you can tell, but, well, let's finish this. Does that look right? This is like 0.25, but you multiply by 10. Which is like, yeah. Yep. So look, he's spinning faster. How much faster? About 2.5 times faster. And you would really feel this. If, you, if you've never done this before, maybe when we get back on campus, like request uh, that your teacher next semester show you this, uh, this demo so you can get a feel for it. It is unbelievable how fast you go when you do this with, with just two little masses in your hand. I think when we do this in the lab, we use uh, eight kilogram masses. 
you have eight kilogram weights that you're holding in, in your hands or maybe 10 and by god you go so fast when you when you pull them in that you feel like you're gonna be sick i mean it's like being on an amusement park ride it's really crazy i find this to be utterly fascinating because if you think about what happens here since you start off with some initial speed and then you're you go to a place where you have 2.5 times the speed right there's a huge amount of power in, in in what we're saying here in terms of what angular momentum is I, I always like to think about imagine you're in outer space okay and you've been you've been flung from some airlock and you're just spinning off into space right and now you're starting to get sick and you feel like you're gonna vomit in your in your like whatever you call it, like your little space suit right you don't want to do that because you're out in outer space and the last thing you need is a bunch of vomit you're trying to breathe through so to stop yourself from spinning what can you do what can you do if you're spinning really out of control and whatever what could you do to make yourself stop from spinning or at least spin a little more slowly you open your arms yeah pull your put your arms out put your legs out make yourself big right you want to push your arms out you increase your moment inertia you want to spread your legs out as much as possible that's the only way you can really slow yourself down there and it's completely internal to yourself right just because of the fact that you can move your arms means you can you can slow yourself down this would be true for skydivers it's true for people that dive off of diving platforms right let's let's just bring this home to what i was saying earlier like so if you have if you think about the way a high diver works and there's a part c that's a problem we'll do it in a second but i don't want to so you think about people um that, that jump off those like 10 meter platforms have any of you guys ever jumped off one of these before anyone ever jumped off a 10 meter platform into a pool it's like 33 feet up i jumped off one of these when i was like i don't know like 12 or something like this i went to a place that had like an olympic swimming pool in this little tiny tiny town in oklahoma called bartlesville and um i stood up on top of this thing and i looked down and i was like i didn't think i ever had a fear of heights but at that moment i was extremely afraid because like it's so far <laughs> you're so far up in the air when you jump off these things it doesn't look like it when you're watching it on tv but jesus christ is it tall it gets really really scary so you, you put your arms above your head like this is what the divers do right they put their arms above their head right they make that their bodies as big as they possibly can they jump into the air, right? And they basically, they come into the air, so like this is their body now. Oh, whoops, sorry. This is their body. Here. So like here's their hands going up above their head, and here's their feet down here, right? They start off with a really, really big moment of inertia. Right? And the, the thing they have to do is they have to start rotating immediately. So they jump off and they start rotating, right? And then what do they do to make themselves spin fast? They pull their arms into their body, they pull their knees into their body as well, and they basically become smaller, right? Now, this is a small moment of inertia. So if they started off spinning here with an initial angular speed here, now they're spinning with a huge omega final. So this starts off as small, and then this goes to big. They continue this process. They get like three to five spins in or whatever, flips or whatever you want to call it. And then right before they hit the water, they've got to slow themselves down again, right? Because they don't want to you know, like drawing upside down. So this would be their head, this would be their feet, this would be their legs, and then their arms would be extended like this. So you go back to big. I final, that slows the spin down, just like we were talking about with the astronaut. Uh, it's accelerated because of gravity, because they're falling, yeah. Their, yeah their, their linear speed is increasing. The velocity of their center of mass is definitely increasing as they go down. Um, the rate at which they spin, though, has nothing to do with gravity. It just has everything to do with uh, conservation of angular momentum. This stops them from spinning as fast, which allows them to go into the water at a nice uh, like kind of swan dive or whatever you want to call it. Okay, that's mode of inertia and how it comes into play in, in this particular situation here. Does that make sense to you guys? It stands out a little bit there if we make it black. Okay. The same thing is true of skateboarders when they go up half pipes, right? Um, maybe we'll, I'll pull up a video here during the break and we'll just like look at, like watch someone actually doing that with their body. Okay, we've done everything except for the last part here. So let's solve for that. Um, we wanna find the change in kinetic energy and its cause, if any. So to find the energy change, We're just gonna find the initial kinetic energy and the final kinetic energy, and we will uh, figure out the change. 
So the kinetic energy, the final kinetic energy is going to be, it's rotating, right? So it's going to be 1 half I final multiplied by omega final squared. That is to say, moment of inertia final times final angular speed. And we subtract from this 1 half uh, I naught times omega naught squared. So this is going to be 1 half. I think I final was um, 6.4. Omega final was 2.5 pi. Minus 1 half. I initial was 16. And then omega initial, the initial angular speed was pi. So my change in kinetic energy, here you guys can calculate this if you want to. We're gonna end, uh, okay, where's my button? Oh, did you figure it out? Is it 118? I want to write down what individually each of them are, too. So, so it's 0.5 times 6.4 times... So this first one looks like it's about 200 or so, 197. So this is 197 joules. Can I write joules minus... Seventy nine joules. So one eighteen, that sounds about right. Now I've done some rounding here, but yeah, I got the same thing. One one eight J. So what happened to the kinetic energy? It actually increased, right? an increase in total energy or anything like that, but an increase in kinetic energy. Now, we also want to talk about its cause. What do you guys think? What, 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 what is it that actually caused this kinetic energy in this case to increase? Notice that the angular momentum was that it didn't change. The angular momentum is constant, but the energy changed. This is something similar. Well, yeah. Mode of inertia reduction, right? Uh, the increased angular velocity, that's right. The the rate at which this went down was nowhere near as much as the rate at which this went up. And this part's squared, so mathematically, definitely you're right about that. Um, but, you know, energy basically can't be created or destroyed. It can really only be transformed between forms. So where did that increase come from? Um... Like, are the, are the masses at a lower uh, level, basically? Okay. Uh, I would say no. From the guy moving his arms. I don't know. Yeah, that's actually right. That's the answer. He moved his arms. That took energy, right? He had to put energy into pulling his arms in, right? That's right. I mean, he had to basically spend chemical energy from his body to pull those masses in. And uh, that's where I would say it came from. He did work basically, right? He did some amount of work. This is the amount of work he had to do um, in order to... And if, if you sit in one of these chairs and you do this, you'd feel it. Like, you'd literally feel the rate at which the work you're doing gets turned into kinetic energy, basically. And that's basically what's happening here. At least I think that's what's happening. You guys have other ideas? Okay. I could be wrong about that, but I think that's the answer. I could be wrong about a lot of things, but... I do know that this is how you solve these kind of problems. Um, where this is coming from, I'm pretty sure it's from the energy that he consumed by... or, or used by pulling his arms in. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, that was 55 minutes, so we should take a break. Um, it's now 3.35, so we'll take a break till 4.45. Try to find some like something for you guys to, to watch related to angular momentum. Yeah, I'm gonna mute my mic. If you guys do have questions, let me know. Hey John, what's up? Did you figure it out? I I think you're in the wrong channel. <laughs> That's okay, we're on a break. <laughs> Is everything okay? <laughs> that is fun.
Okay, I'm back. I hope you guys realized that it wasn't a break until 4.45 p.m., but it was supposed to be 3.45 p.m. I hope. It should have been. An hour, hour and ten minute break would be kind of silly. That would push us up right to the end of class. All right. Let's get started again. You have a question real quick about Thursday's lecture. Thursday is when I have uh, physics 1C. I guess you mean Wednesday? Yeah, what's up? This is from last time. Yeah, this problem here? Right, this is... Okay, yeah, yeah, So I can give you a couple ways you can think about it. Um, so what I did was, I basically told you guys, like, that this force has a bigger lever arm than this force right here. By a factor of four. Right, I think B is 0.4, yeah, and... Um, oh, no. Yeah, B is 0.4, and R was 0.1. So the, this, this force has a bigger lever arm. It ends up winning out in the long run. Um, and yeah, I kind of just went with that assumption. I didn't really give you guys much of a better reason why it should definitely have to point this way. Um, clockwise is positive. It's rolling itself up. That's what's weird about this, exactly. Yeah. It's like a tug of war. And the tension makes it go clockwise. Sorry, the tension makes it go counterclockwise. The friction makes it go clockwise. So. Yep. Yep, it was negative. The torque is negative. Well, that's, it's, a, it's a good point you bring up, because notice that the tension is positive here, but it's negative here. And I totally understand why that might be very confusing. You see what I mean? The reason why tension's positive here is because we took the direction of acceleration to be positive. Right? That was something we've always done with linear, with, the, with this equation. We've always said, um, yeah, with net force equals mass times acceleration, we say you make the direction of acceleration positive. That's what we did here. But when it comes to this, uh, rotational motion is a little different. I, c I can give you another example, another way to, to do this. Th this is, um, there's another way. To sit. Come on, there we go. There's another way to do it, actually. So, when we did the problem before, we made this point right here to be our axis, right? But you don't have to do that. You can actually pick a different point. Like this one. Now this axis is a special axis. It's, it's something that I, I don't ever talk about in my physics classes, but it's, it's, what, it's kind of almost necessary to describe for this one here. If we go back to this document here. Here we go. Instantaneous axis, okay? Instantaneous axis. This is some point that does not move for an instance, for an instant, delta t equals zero. Examples, a fixed pivot point or the surface contact point, this is what we're gonna be doing here, for an object undergoing pure rolling. These are two examples of where you can use something called the instantaneous axis. And it says that if you use the instantaneous axis, I know that looks like 1a, it stands for ia, then for dynamics problems, instead of using equations one and two, which are back up here, here we go. These two equations, right? That's how we solved it before, right? We said net force was equal to MA. We said net torque was equal to the moment of inertia about the center of mass times alpha, right? That's, that's exactly what we did to solve the problem. 
what's being said here is you can actually avoid doing that if you choose the instantaneous axis to be your angular, to be your, to your thing. So let's see what happens if we do that. Okay. And notice that it's the surface contact point for an object undergoing pure rolling, which is exactly what we have here. So if we, t this is going to be our instantaneous axis. This is our I A instantaneous axis. And the equation says the net torque about that axis should be equal to moment of inertia. I think the moment of inertia has to be about that same axis too. I need to go back to the notes to make sure. Yep, it's the mode of inertia about the axis now, by comparison with what we did before, which was the mode of inertia about the center of mass. This is really technical stuff now, so I hope you're still following with me. So we need the moment of inertia about the instantaneous axis, and then we multiply that times the angular acceleration, okay? We will, yep, that's exactly right. That's right, yep. So let's do that. So, um, and this is gonna be times of angular acceleration. So what we do is we imagine it's actually rotating about this point right here. We say moment of inertia about the instantaneous axis, I would say, would be equal to the moment of inertia about the center of mass um, plus um, mass times uh, the distance squared, where d is going to be this distance here. Uh, it's actually, in our case, it's equal to, to b. So d is equal to b. Um, the moment of inertia about the center of mass in this problem, this was the problem where you had this mk squared thing, right? And we, we probably solved for this some point, didn't we? What I was? Eh, did we? Nope, we never really did. So we'll just have to do that. But we do have all of our information here, which we can use to solve this. Let's get this stuff. Let's put it down here, too. Maybe right here. Paste. So it's going to be mk squared. And I think we're using capital M now. plus the mass times b squared. So it basically ends up just being m times k squared plus b squared. And we can calculate this. So capital M is 5 kg. And then k was 0 0.2 plus b, which is, I think, 0 0.4. And this is equal to. equal to 1. <laughs> that makes me laugh. Is that right? You guys agree? Did I do that right? 0 0.04 plus 0 0.16 this is, yeah, it's 0.2 so it's 1. Yep. Okay. Um, so that's the moment of inertia about the instantaneous axis. Now what about torque? Well, the torque is actually now going to be about this point. Um, the weight and the normal force, those aren't going to produce any torque. Would you guys agree? The tension force is definitely going to produce a torque. Let's put that in there. What way is it going to rotate now? Now this part is obvious, right? There's only one force, so it has to rotate this way, right? It has to rotate that way because the T is about this axis at least. It's it's. It's like the whole thing is going to be rotating around like this. Like, imagine that it's it's like rolling around that point, right? Let me click back on this so I can actually see what you guys are saying. Wow, Discord booted him for about half an hour. Wow. That sucks. Okay. All right, so, but you guys see what I mean? Ash, like, from this perspective, it's obvious which way it's going to roll. I mean, obvious isn't the right word, probably, but it's clear, maybe, which way it's going to have to roll out that axis, because... The friction force doesn't exert any torque about that point, right? So our entire torque now is just going to be the tension T times whatever the distance between these two points is, right? And in this case, I think that's B minus R. Now, you're, you're starting to think about it in terms of the previous axis now, though. Yeah, you're right. But not in terms of, but not in terms of this axis, right? It's definitely going to produce counterclockwise torque about the center, but not about this axis, right? Because I have a fixed point, and then I've got my lever arm, and then I've got a force. Because it's a new axis, right? And if that's all the torque, well, then that has to be... So that gives you one equation. 
I don't know that we have enough information to solve this equation, though, do we? Because we need to find alpha and we don't know t. So then we do need another equation, which would then be our force equation. And what do we know about friction? We didn't actually... No, we didn't know the friction. Actually, we don't know the friction. Oh, we have this, though. That's why. Eh. Let's see. Let's see if we get the same answer doing this. I've never tried to solve this this way. Well, we solved... We, we found that it was 18.5 newtons by solving it, right? I think you... See, I think you also now need... Unless I'm misunderstanding something here. I think you still need net fx equal to ma. And you also need for the other mass that net force in the y direction was equal to little m times a. But we said that the acm and the a were related by another equation, right? It was like uh, right here. So we still have to go through the rest of the problem, I guess figure it out. And, and, and maybe you can try to do that after class and you can see if you get the same answer, but that's one way in which you can see which way it's rotating, is by considering the instantaneous axis. Yeah, this is not something I learned in school, by the way. I never heard about it until I came to El Camino, so. I, people at El Camino, they, they know things that we don't learn about in Oklahoma, and it's, it's definitely good good tricks. I know that there's a lot of problems that can be solved that way. If you had Julio, he may have mentioned it, because I know he's pretty big on using that, if I understand correctly. But I don't know if you would have talked about it in 2A. It might be a little bit above 2A. I'm not sure. Whatever that means. Okay. What's up? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. In that problem, the pulley did not have any effects, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. The pulley was, quote, a perfect pulley, just to kind of simplify the problem just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go for um, another 50 minutes or so with lecture. So we need to start recording again, and I need to get something ready to go here. So we just solved this one. And now we're going to get really fancy. Which one do I want to do next? I think this is the easiest one to do first. It's already pretty tricky, too. Oops. Oh, right. Copy, cut. This is the classic angular momentum cut problem. Like This right here is the kind of thing you're going to see a lot in your homework. Um, Okay, so I, I think this is probably the best time to go back here and just reiterate something that I showed you a second ago. So this is what we're working on now, right here. The, the next few problems we're gonna we're gonna look at are gonna be about what's what's highlighted here in this box. So now we're gonna be talking about two body two body interactions. I don't know if you can tell, but the two problems that we just did, which I'll show them to you, this one, which was a cord and a ball. And this one, which was a man holding some things, each of these would be considered a one-body interaction. Even though the man is holding some weights, the man plus the weights and the turntable all compose the entire system of the problem. So it's one object. We're now going to talk about objects where you start off with... Um, it's two objects, basically, where collisions occur. Okay, Just like we did with momentum. Okay, Now there's two possibilities when you have these interactions, these collisions. If there's no friction between the objects and there's no pivot point, these are the trickier kind of problems. This is what we're going to do second. We're going to start with the easier problems where there is a pivot point. Okay, Let's read what this says right here. When there is a pivot point upon collision, there is usually a large impulse at the pivot. The pivot actually absorbs a lot of the, the force of the impact. So that means that linear momentum is not conserved. Okay, You can't use conservation of linear momentum. However, if you treat the interacting colliding objects as a system, 
the only external force is at the pivot, which means the net torque about the pivot is zero. So we have conservation of angular momentum about the pivot, and that's what we're going to use to solve this problem, at least to begin with. Okay. So when you have a fixed pivot point, okay, linear momentum is not conserved, but angular momentum is conserved specifically about that pivot point. Okay, that's what we're going to use for this problem. In this problem, you have a small ball that's traveling to the right. It has a speed v naught, and it collides with and sticks to one end of a uniform rod that has a mass of m and a length l, which is hanging at rest on a frictionless pivot here. So basically, think about this as like, I mean, the thing that comes to mind for me, and this is maybe too redneck Oklahoma, but like you go to these shooting galleries where like you've got these little things that hang down and you shoot them with a bullet and then they fling around. The masses are the same in the case, yes. So basically this this is like a little it could be like a, you could think of it as a doggy door if you want to, right? It's just a little pivot with a with a piece of wood hanging down and it's and this object collides with I think it sticks to it, right? Yeah, it collides with and sticks to it. So this mass is gonna hit this object, it's gonna stick to it, and then they're gonna swing around up to here where you can see the mass is still kind of like up there, right? So this is our initial situation here. It collides, and then you have a third situation here. We want to find the angular velocity of this combination just after the ball hits and sticks to the rod. Okay? Jesus, you have a question? Do we treat the ball as a point mass? Yes. We're going to treat it as a point mass. That's right. Great question. We're going to treat it as a point mass. That's right. Okay? So, um, as was said in this little document right here, right? Um, net torque about the pivot is zero, which means we have conservation of angular momentum, yeah? So that's what we're gonna use here. Um, I'm gonna draw a second picture. Um, it's kind of already drawn here, but what I'll do is I'll just say that our initial, this is our initial right here, just the ball moving. And when the ball sticks right here, that's our final state, okay? More like an intermediary state, but these are these are our two steps right here. And we're gonna say that the initial angular momentum of the ball should be equal to the final angular momentum of the system. Okay? Now you guys tell me, if this ball is moving along like this, and our pivot right here is this, so that this is our axis that we're going to be using, what's the initial angular momentum of the ball? It's moving along in a straight line, it has a mass m and a speed v naught. What is its angular momentum? Can you guys type in the chat what it would be? Remembering that angular momentum for a point mass is basically just m v r sine phi. Okay, you take mass, someone already said it, you take mass of the object times its velocity, and then you multiply by, in this case, the length. I hate that this is L, but it is what it is. L is length in this case. In fact, instead of that, what if we just use, instead of L, what if we make it this? We'll use curly L so that it can be distinguished between the two symbols here, okay? So we'll just use a curly L for our length. So NVL. Okay? Angle between the velocity and the quote position vector, the position vector would point down like this, so the angle between the two of them would be a right angle. Uh, not L over 2. L is this length here. Okay? This is a image of what happens later in the problem. All right. Or was there another reason why you wanted to use L over 2? Am I getting this wrong? Maybe I'm doing this wrong. Yeah, it, maybe the dotted line here. It's basically like, this is your initial situation. I've got a ball, and then I've got a pivot right here. This is length L. And then the final, this is like initial. And then final is the system is swinging with some angular speed. Okay. All right, mv not l is the initial angular momentum. The final angular momentum should be moment of inertia of this, I'll put it this way. It's gonna be the angular momentum of um, the ball plus the angular momentum of what is it called? A rod. 
Or you could write it as if I take the moment of inertia of the ball and I add to that the moment of inertia of the rod and then I multiply that times the angular speed, that should also work. The moment of inertia of the ball, because it's a point mass, is just going to be m times l squared. And the moment of inertia of the rod, because it's pivoting about one end, I'm pretty sure that it's one third ml squared. Right? So we have, looks like four thirds ml squared times omega. And that's equal to m times v naught times l. Ah, and I'm using the L's wrong here, right? Oh no, what just happened here? View, draw, okay, cool, it's fixed. Yeah, let's let's change these L's to curly L's so you guys don't get confused, or I don't confuse myself. Curly L, curly L, curly L, there we go. And now we can solve this. Um, the angular speed omega looks like it's gonna be equal to four times V naught divided by three L. That all make sense? Right, three quarters. Good point, Co. Oh, my bad. Yep, this should be three over four. Three mv naught l over four ml squared. So one of the l's cancels and the m's cancel. Yeah, three v naught four over, all, over four l. Cool. All right. The next question is. Find the minimum speed v-naught such that the rod makes it over the top. So now we kind of have a new scenario where we want to solve for v-initial if the rod will just barely make it up to here. So what I'm going to say is that once the object gets up to here... Okay, let's, let's do a new picture now. So now our picture is going to be, your initial is going to be like this. So I've got my, my pivot point, I've got my rod, and I've got this uh, mass here. They're stuck together, and the whole system is rotating with an angular speed omega. And we know what that is. It's 3 v naught over 4L. The final scenario now, we'll leave a lot of room here, final. So this is our pivot point. Now the object is going to be up here. The ball's still connected right there. And what I'm going to say is, as long as it can get up to here, it doesn't really need to have any speed in order to keep going, basically. It just has to have just enough speed to get there, and then it should kind of continue through. Um, so since that's the case, we're going to say that its, it's final velocity it's going to be zero, and that its final angular speed is going to be zero. Now, if this was a string, instead of being a rod, this would not be true anymore. Like, if it was a string, it would be required that the string does not go loose when it gets to the top. And we'd have to say the final speed would be something like the square root of the length times g or something like that. But that is not true in this case. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about that. But this is going to be what's going to happen. We're going to say it has a final speed that's zero and a final angular speed that's zero. And it's basically as long... We just want to figure out what does it take speed-wise here so that it can actually make it to the top, okay? Does it make sense? All right. How are we going to solve this part? What do you guys think? Energy. Yep. Energy conservation. That's exactly right. So we're going to say, um, yep, work done by non-conservative forces equal to change in kinetic energy plus change in potential energy. You guys know after what we learned today, we've learned all of mechanics, basically. I'll summarize the end of class, but we really have. So work... What? Yeah, no, I mean, like, we now have the four major rules about how mechanical systems behave. 
energy conservation, momentum conservation, angular momentum conservation, and F equals MA. That's it. Those are the four basic rules that every problem starts with. Does that make sense? Like, any given problem, when I ask the question, how are we going to solve this? One of those four things is going to be your answer, basically. Work energy, impulse momentum, torque angular momentum, and F equal to MA. Like, that's it. That's all problems. They all start from one of those four places. That's what I love about 1A. There's not a lot of different... Like, 1B, 1C, and 1D, it's a lot harder to, like, put everything in a nutshell like that, but 1A you really can. Okay, so... We're going to say zero work done by non-conservative forces, as we often do. We're treating this as a uh, system that has no friction. Our change in kinetic energy now is going to be something like one-half the mass of... See, this is where things start to get really tricky here. Is there going to be any... I'll repeat that at the end of class, Miguel. I'll come, the... I'll come back to the end of class, what I said about the, the big picture stuff. Um, here's, here's what I want to... Does this object have linear kinetic energy? Does it have rotational kinetic energy? Or does it have both? Does it? It's just pure rotation, isn't it? It's not moving. Yep, the center of mass of the object is going in a circle. It's not translating. So, we don't need to worry about our one-half mv squared term. We only need to worry about the rotational energy term. Now, this, in a problem, problems we'll do next, that won't be true. But for this problem, all we have is rota it's pure rotation. Right? This is a pure rotation system. There is no translation. That means you do not need one-half mv squared. Um, so, one-half I multiplied by um, omega final squared plus omega initial squared. Now, for the change of the potential energy, potential energy due to gravity, what we could do here is we could look at the whole system and calculate the change in the height of the center of mass. And then we could put the total mass multiply. You could write it like this. You'd be M times g times uh, y center of mass final minus y center of mass initial. That's one thing we could do, where the total mass would be 2m, I think, right? Because I think this is m, and this is m. Right? So we could do that. It's probably a little easier, though, to just break them up and look at... Whoops, I thought that was a eraser. Probably a little easier to just do this. We'll take um, the mass of the ball which I know is just m, multiplied by g, multiplied by its y final minus y initial, um, plus the mass of the rod, again, I know it's also m, times uh, its y final minus its y initial. But they're going to have different values. So we're going to say this is for the ball, and this is for the rod. Okay. And, and I could put ball, ball, rod, rod, if you want to, but then I think it's, just, it's really messy, right? So just, we'll, just, we'll just go through it um, as best we can. So... Ah! Yep, 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 yep. That's a minus sign there. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My bad. Thanks. Oh, I forgot the G right here, too. Yep, we'll put it at the end. Times... Ooh, can't write over there. Right, G. Okay, now we know omega final is zero. With i, we found that i was like four-thirds ml squared, I think, right? So our expression is going to be something like this. One-half i times... Oh, whoops, it's not my bad. Sorry. That's the one that's zero, right? Omega initial is this one. So it's that times negative omega initial squared. Plus. Mass of the ball is m times g. Y final minus y initial. Let's call this y equal to zero. What would the y coordinate of this be? Let's say it'd be negative l, right? And the y-coordinate of this part would be positive L. So for me, I'm going to put mg times uh, positive L for y-final minus negative L. So 2L, we'll get out of that. Plus the mass of the rod multiplied by g 
and then times y final for the rod. Well, the rod basically went, and this is where we have to think about center of mass. The center of mass of the rod went from here up to here. So its initial y coordinate should be something like negative L over two, and then its final y coordinate should be something like positive L over two. Right? So plugging that in over here, we're gonna have y final for the rod is L over two minus negative L over two. All right, let's to move this term to the left-hand side. Let's see, there's gonna be two over three ML squared times, I'll put omega naught in later, omega naught, equal to. Now, if we add all this stuff together, I think this is mg times 2L plus mg times, I think, L. That is to say that's equal to 3MGL. The masses cancel, and we get something like 2 over 9. Oops. 2 over 9. Um, yeah, I keep mixing the L's up. I'm so sorry. Oh, no. I can't pick the thing again. Yep. That right there should have been squared. Thank you for noticing that. That's absolutely right. Yeah, I'll shut it down and open it again. That's probably fine. Draw, erase, click. L. And then erase. And then L. 2 over 9. Um, there's an L squared here and there's an L there. Let's just not let's, let's not skip so many steps. Here, let's just let's take this a little slower. Two over three. Let's cancel the masses out first. Let's cancel one of the links out too. We'll have L omega naught squared is equal to three g. So what I did was I canceled. No, don't do that. I canceled this L with this L, this mass with this mass, and then I got that expression there. Now, if we want to find our answer, which was ultimately like, what's the initial speed of the ball supposed to be such that it swings through this, we now need to plug this in. So we're going to have 2 over 3 L omega naught squared. So that's going to be 9 V naught squared divided by 16 L squared, right? If you square this, that's what you're gonna get. That's equal to three G. So V naught then, what we got left here? Nine over nine, those cancel two over six. I think it's one over eight. This is what you get. Is that like right? Great. Okay, hey, Zeus, go for it, man. Hmm. 
Our center of rotation is the center of mass or the pivot. It's the pivot. It's the pivot. It's the pivot. I'm going to tie that back to what I said before we started this, which is that when there is a pivot point, right, um, you get conservation of angular momentum about the pivot. When there's no pivot, you choose the center of mass. That's what we'll do next. But in this problem, when there is a pivot, it's just conservation of angular momentum about the pivot. I'm always afraid I'm not recording. Uh, where are we at? One note, where are you? There we go. Yes, the center of mass definitely changes when the ball sticks to the rod. That's right. When the ball sticks to the rod... So what I was labeling here was the center of mass of just the rod alone. Maybe I should have been more clear about that. But yeah, the center of mass gets shifted down this way whenever the ball sticks to it. And that's something that's going to come up in one, one more of the problems that we do here. If we have time. We're gonna, I, think we, I think we have time to do two more. You know, one way to memorize that, or to remember it is, so you've got two systems, right? You've either got a rod that's rotating about its center, or you have a rod that's rotating about its end, right? Now, what does your intuition tell you? Which one of these should have uh, the larger amount of inertia? Well, it's, ba it's balanced about this point, right? There's equal mass on both sides, so it should be a little easy. And you can try this with your pencil. Try to rotate it uh, about the center, and then try to rotate it about the end, and you'll, you'll realize that, yeah, the center has lower removal inertia. That's right. You, you, it's very easy to rotate it about the center. It's a little harder to rotate it about the end. So I would say that the mode of inertia about the end should be like this. Now, you know that one of these is one-third, and one of them is one-twelfth, right? So which one's smaller? Is it one-third, or is it one-twelfth? That's how I memorize it, at least. Center is 1 12th. Yep. I, I don't know if the picture is could throwing you off, because maybe you think it looks like the rod has a length of 2L. It doesn't. It has a length of just L. And that's a pivot. That's why I redrew it down here like this, going up to here. Okay. No, you got it. Good. Okay. Whatever I said that helps you, so glad to hear it. No problem. It's quite literally why I'm here, just to solve these things, or to, to answer your questions like that. Okay, uh, do y'all have any questions, or is this good? Alright, so we have a couple more problems we can solve. Now things are going to get a lot more complicated. Like, I'm, I'm doing this like, it's like we're going, we're stepping up in difficulty each time, right? And, um, this, I really want to do this, this problem, example five. If we don't have time today, that's, that's not a big deal, but, um, we'll do this one first. It's a little bit easier. Okay. So, this is our problem. I, I really want to, like, just give you guys some time to try to solve one of these. But it's like, I don't think I can get there until we do one of each type, I guess? Because they're each just a little bit different. Like, there's just subtle differences between these problems. So let's read this one. We have two small masses, okay? M and 2M. That's this one and this one. They're joined by a light, rigid rod. Light meaning we're going to assume it's masses. With length L. Again, we're not going to use this L. We're going to make it L. As shown and lay on a horizontal frictionless plane. A disk of mass M is sliding at a speed V0 towards the smaller mass. It hits and sticks to the smaller mass. So this is our initial system, right? And our final is gonna look something like this. OK, 
Okay. It's going to be rotating. See, it says it hits and sticks to the smaller mass, right? Now, in the previous problem, there was a pivot point, right? In this problem, it's basically just two objects lying on a flat surface, separated by something, and they get hit by another object coming in from the left, okay? I think you guys would agree that would cause the system to rotate, right? Imagine a baseball bat sitting on a table, or you got a baseball bat here, and you throw a ball this way at it, but the ball is like made of putty, so it sticks to it, right? It's going to have to rotate, right? Is that all that it's going to do? Is it just... It's also going to pick up some linear speed too, right? I mean, you can try this yourself with on a table with like a pencil and like... It's it's also going to start to rotate. Well, it's going to rotate, but also it's going to start to... Tra Oops. It's also going to start to translate with some velocity of the center of mass. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. Now, in this particular problem, one of the things that's really nice about it is since you have equal masses on both sides, the center of mass is now right here. Right? Would you guys agree? That's simple, right? 2m and 2m, the center of mass is right there. But that center of mass is going to have some velocity, and that's going to be what we call the velocity of the center of mass. This is one of the things we have to calculate. Okay? So, our goal is to find the center of mass of the combination and its final linear velocity. So that's this, this is what we're going to calculate. And then find the rotation, final rotational inertia about the center of mass and the final angular velocity about the center of mass, and then we'll solve some other things, okay? But the main difference here is that now we do not have a fixed pivot point, and so now we have to go back and look at this thing again. Man, it's getting really cold in my house. All right, uh, where is it? Here, 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 here. So now let's look at let's look at this part. A, no friction and no pivot, okay? If no external force or torque yields conservation of linear momentum with the normal mass one times v1 prime plus mass two times v2 prime. This is the like momentum after is equal to momentum before. And conservation of angular momentum or conservation on angular momentum. That feels like a strange proposition to use there, but with no pivot, choose the center of choose the center of mass of the system for an axis. Okay, this is the key thing here. When you do not have a pivot, you need to choose the center of mass of the system as an axis. Okay. But we'll use both conservation of linear and angular momentum and we'll use the center of mass as our pivot. So, that's our new pivot point. And we're going to take that center of mass, and I'm going to redraw it on this picture point picture here to say this is going to be our pivot for the first point, first part, pivot or rotational axis. It's not really pivoted about that point, so calling it a pivot is probably the wrong word, but it's 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 the this is the point about which we're going to define angular momentum, okay? All right, part A. Find the center of mass of this combination and its final linear velocity. Well, we've already found that the center of mass of the combination is right in the center, right? To find its final linear velocity, what we just read says we're going to use conservation of angular momentum. We're going to say the initial angular, sorry, conservation of linear momentum. Initial linear momentum, p naught should be equal to final linear momentum, pf. The initial linear momentum of the system, very simple. This is the only thing moving. A mass moves to the right with an initial speed v0. So you go m times v0 equals the final momentum of the system is going to be the total mass of the system, which is 4m. Oh, sorry about that. I should have the four. You take 4 times the mass. That's the total mass of our system, right? And now you multiply by the velocity of the center of mass because it's going to be the thing that's moving is the center of mass. I really shouldn't put a... Which, if you look at this, it tells you immediately that the velocity of the center of mass is equal to v naught over 4. Pretty easy, right? Okay. Things get a little trickier in the second part. We want to find the rotational inertia about the center of mass and the final angular velocity about the center of mass. Okay, this isn't that much trickier, actually. So, here's our initial... Here's the final. And we want to say, what's the final rotational inertia? Well, um, the final rotational inertia is just going to be equal to, I've got two masses up here, 2m. They are a distance of how far? They're a distance of L over 2 from the center of mass. 
we're using this as our axis, right? So that's also what we have to define the mode of inertia about. So it's gonna be 2m multiplied by the distance L over two, whole squared. That's the, that's a point mass, right? Remember if I have an object that's going around in a circle and it has, uh, if this length right here is L and this is M, then the mode of inertia is equal to ML squared, right? That's the, that's the point mass. So I have two of those, but the distance is L over two. So it becomes L over two squared. Um, yeah. In addition, there's, there's really four of them actually, isn't there? What I should really be doing is instead of putting a two here, I should put a four here, right? Because there's four masses that same distance away, right? There's two M up here and there's another two M down here. So I think this just gives us ML squared, right? So now we use our other thing that we can use. Again, let's look at this. We just use conservation of linear momentum. Now we use conservation of angular momentum. So we say, uh, initial angular momentum of our system has to be equal to the final angular momentum of the system. The initial angular momentum is going to be given by m times v naught multiplied by. Now we use the pivot. Now even though it's not rotating, but that's going to be our new axis or pivot once it does start rotating. So we use that distance. So it's going to be m v naught times l over two should be equal to um, i final times the angular speed omega. That's what we're trying to figure out is the angular velocity about the center of mass. So now we say I final was ML squared. We're solving for omega. So we end up getting omega is equal to, let's see what's left here. One of the L's cancels, both the M's cancel, and I think you get V naught over 2L. Does that all make sense? Okay, so let's look at our system. I basically have 2m up here. I have 2m down here, right? And then I've got this rod. We're, we're ignoring the, the mass of the rod. This is our pivot point, right? The distance to the pivot is L over 2 and L over 2. So each one of the masses contributes m times L over 2 whole squared and there's four of them, right? It's mass times the distance squared. This is the distance. That's what's L over two. No problem. So we end up getting this. Did my math work out right? Do you guys have any problem? Does that look right to you guys? Okay, part C, was mechanical energy conserved? Well, to figure out if mechanical energy is conserved in this system, since it's on a flat surface, we don't have to worry about the potential energy. Um, we can just calculate what it is. So the initial energy is really going to be just initial kinetic energy. I think the initial kinetic energy is basically just one half mv naught squared, right? Just the one mass. Yep. And I think the final kinetic energy is going to be um, one half I final multiplied by omega squared, which we said I final was ML squared. And omega final is that. So we have final kinetic energy is, oops, is equal to, what do we have left here? An eight. So if I took the ratio, for example, of the final kinetic energy divided by the initial kinetic energy, then I think what I would get is, what, an eighth divided by a half, so a quarter. It's a one to four relationship, which means, you know, this is something like 25%. Um, yeah, so 25% of the, the energy is now been converted from kinetic energy into something else. All right, does that look uh, look good to you guys? All righty. 
Okay, the next one we're going to do is significantly harder than this. Uh, I guess the answer is just... The answer is just no, you're right, Via. I, I mentioned the 25% because it's kind of the way that that problem gets asked sometimes. Is you, In my homework, it'll say something like, what percentage of the final kinetic energy do you have left or something? You know what I mean? Like, it'll say stuff like that. What's up, Ash? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that part next, yeah. Just want to make sure this all makes sense. Well, now we know that this object is basically going in a circle, right? And we know how long it takes radians-wise to be this, right? So we could say for part D, let's go back to black again. Um, let's take the numbers we know. So we know that omega we can find um, the time that it takes to move in for, for one rotation would be the period. Um, one revolution is going to be equal to 2 pi uh, divided by omega. This is the period of its motion, right? So if we take 2 pi and we divide by v naught over 2L, we get the period of motion is 4 pi L over v naught, I think. Right, that's the time for one revolution. So if we take, if I want to know how far it moves, delta x, I would take its velocity and we'd multiply by the period. And I think VCM was V naught divided by four. Multiplied by four pi L over V naught. And we end up getting pi times L. That's what we wanted, right? How far does it, the distance travel when the rod makes one revolution? You guys have a mastering a physics problem that's extremely similar to this problem, by the way. Except I think it involves, like, two ice skaters that are running at each other. So it's a little bit different, but it's pretty similar to this. So pi times L is actually equal to the circumference. Right? Because you have this system where this is L, right? The, this is basically the diameter, right? So the distance that it travels is the same as the size of the circumference, right? So literally it, it rotates like this way, this way, this way, and then this way and then back to where it began, and then that distance is basically equal to the circumference. It's kind of somewhat like a wheel, yeah, right, just like wheels. The, the distance that a wheel rolls in one revolution is equal to its circumference, right? I don't know that that will always work, and we can see if that's true in the next problem if you want to, but I don't know that this is always going to be exactly equal to the circumference. Circumfer... what... A, <laughs> that's not... this is how you spell that word. Circum... fur... ence. There we go. Circumference. Not whatever I wrote up here. Alright. So... That's that. That's that problem. Man, it's 441. Do you guys have any questions? Mm -hmm. Well, this ball, once it sticks here in this position, its velocity relative to the other mass that it's stuck to is now zero, but it still has some tangential velocity. Um, the thing is that since it's collided with this system, 
some of its momentum now has to be absorbed and shared between the entire object. So that's why it's like momentum of this thing is equal to the momentum of the whole thing. And in order to really identify what that is, we have to talk specifically about the velocity of the center of mass of the system. Because it's the whole object that's moving, right? It's not just the ends. Because like once this thing hits it, not only is the top going to rotate, but the middle's going to rotate. And it's going to be rotating about the center of mass while the center of mass is translating. It has to rotate about the center of mass, by the way. It basically has to. No problem. So, other questions you guys have? So look, I, I kind of want to do this next problem, but I also kind of want to do something a little different since we're, I know for a fact we will not possibly be able to solve this today. I'd kind of like to just introduce the problem talk to you guys about it and then like have you guys kind of think about it before you come to class next time so we can so we can do it together oh uh, whoops okay cut and then like i could do this but i i think you guys are gonna run out of steam energy and focus and i want you guys to have a good focus on doing this problem because it's really quite tricky so let's just look about it and talk about what's going on it's almost identical to what we just did. The difference being, instead of there having these two uh, fixed like, things, um, it says, a small ball of mass M and speed V-naught collides with and sticks to one end of a uniform rod. The mass of the rod is 2M, and it has a length of 120 centimeters, which was at rest on horizontal frictionless ice. We need to find the center of mass of this combination and its final linear velocity, and we want to find the rotational inertia about the center of mass and the final angular velocity about the center of mass. It's almost the exact same questions that we solved before. Um, yeah, so... Why don't you guys just try to solve part A? Why don't you guys try to solve part A? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the recording now and just say that um, this is we're gonna we're gonna solve this in class next time, but for the next like ten to fifteen minutes, I'm just gonna like sit here and like answer questions about this problem and let you guys kind of try to set it up, and we'll go through the solution next time. So uh, I'll be seeing you guys that are watching on YouTube in a couple days. <laughs>